morning, everyone. So nice to be uh, worshiping in the God's house today with each and every one of you. Uh, we have uh, just just a recap. I don't know who was here last weekend, last Saturday night. I think pretty much almost everyone was. Uh, I don't know how much you guys, uh, how you felt about it, but I thought it was amazing. We had a, an agape communion. I've never actually participated in one. Uh, before, and I, I was told the meals are normally better, but I thought it was a great spread of food. But the spiritual component, just reminding ourselves of Christ and what he's done for us, his broken body and blood, and that there's reconciliation with God to make things right moving forward. It was just good to have that reminder uh, and to spend time with each other. Um, one of the highlights I thought was really nice was uh, we had a bonfire out uh, outside and just uh, instructions to write something down that you're struggling with, an addiction, whatever it is, on a piece of paper and throw it in the fire, symbolically saying, listen, Lord, I commit this to you and you need to help me take care of this. And so I really appreciated that as well. Uh, special thanks to everyone who showed up for the work bee. <laughs> uh, you know, there was a story in the Bible of someone who was asked to do work. The two sons were asked to do work. One said, oh yeah, I'll show up and do the work. That was me. Okay, I said I was going to show up and do the work, and who, who didn't show up to do the work? That, that was me. But the son who said, yeah, I'm not going to do that, but did show up, he was really doing the, the master's will. So special thanks. You can see the grounds there are much uh, nicer and cleaner. Special thanks to everyone who did that. In my defense, I was helping a, a friend whose fence fell over, so that's my excuse. But there are many excuses that don't justify what we do necessarily. So special thanks to everyone involved with that. There's Christmas program. There are Christmas programs coming up. Uh, Kevin and Ina are doing two separate different events, both looking for volunteers. Ina's taking care of the kids program. Kevin's taking care of uh, anyone who has a special talent or gift they'd like to share. But we're looking for volunteers. So please see Kevin and, and Ina uh, to help with that. Next weekend, I always say this is how you know you're in the South, peanut boil. Again, I'm going to add it to my list of things never been done before, but uh, a peanut boil, apparently something you do in the South. So I'm, I'm looking forward to eating apparently squishy peanuts. I'm not sure how I'm going to feel about this one, but I'm, I'm willing to try anything. So uh, vegetarian, if it's disgusting, strange animal products, not quite as much, but I, I, can, I can swallow a, a uh, waterlogged peanut, I'm sure. Um, but we're going to have Vespers, so connect the spiritual component with that as well. Actually, a pastor said that he was going through the line at a church in Mississippi, and there would actually be women with their purses, and there would be the peanut boils. They, they would put extra peanuts in their purses to take home. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to this experience. Uh, so that's next weekend. Please bring your bags for the homeless. We're trying to bring bags. So again, we're not just supposed to here to speak the message. We're supposed to live the message. So re reaching people that uh, maybe are, are, are less fortunate than us. Uh, so this time of year, uh, certainly as it gets colder, it's important to think of others who uh, are, may go without if we don't help them. Uh, every, one, every Tuesday night, women's prayer meeting uh, online. So uh, try to look in your bulletin for information on that, as well as a Wednesday night prayer meeting. We're studying the book of Matthew right now, so that's awesome. Christmas party coming up, to be determined date, activities. And uh, I think that's it, unless anyone else has any other announcements. All right, let's... Uh, Continue with reverence as we worship God. Dear Heavenly Father, as we gather before you this morning and worship you on your Sabbath day, we pray that you would be with us, that you would open our hearts and minds 
to the teachings that you have for us today, that you would bind Satan and his angels and keep him far away from us, and that as we worship you, we could come into a full experience of your rest on this Sabbath day. We pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is 249, Praise Him, Praise Him. Happy Sabbath. Today's offering goes to the local church budget. Is our faithfulness to God first? Ellen G. White noted the following. We are not to consecrate to him what remains of our income after all our real or imaginary wants are satisfied. But before any portion is consumed, we should set apart that which God has specified as his. Many persons will meet all inferior demands and dues and leave to God only the last gleanings, if there be any. If not, his cause must wait till a more convenient season, review and herald. When we are unfaithful with our tithes and offerings, we are sending a message 
We send a message when we choose to put God and the spreading of the gospel as a secondary or tertiary priority. We send a message that his cause must wait. The plan of salvation was activated and Jesus volunteered to die for humanity on the cross. But what if he would have said, I don't really know about this, or why don't we wait a bit and see how this whole thing will play out? Could you imagine if Jesus would have chosen to relegate humanity and its salvation as non-important? God placed the salvation of humanity as a first priority in his life from the foundation of the world, according to Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4. Let us remain faithful and place God first as well by returning his tithes and offerings. Deacons, come forward. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day that we may be here to worship you. And Lord, I pray that you speak through the person t preaching today and help us to be wise with our words and to be a witness to those around us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. amen. Our scripture reading for this morning is taken from Daniel chapter 5, verses 25 to 29. That is Daniel chapter 5, verse 25 through 29. I will be reading from the King James Version. And the word of God says, And this is the writing that was written, Mine, mine, take hell, you farson. This is the interpretation of the thing, mine, God had numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Peres, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then commanded Belshazzar, and they clothed Daniel with scarlet and put a chain of gold about his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Amen. And now it's time for the children's story, Jeff Marlowe. boys and girls when you get done bring your buckets of the offering put up front you can go back to your seats and we're gonna have a children's story for you all right well you know I I work in the wor world of the medical field and so I enjoy things about health and so today's story is going to be learning a little more about our bodies okay and specifically we're going to cover one organ in particular 
I was talking to uh, a patient this, uh, not too long ago actually, and uh, we were just going through uh, talking about some different challenges he was having, and I always like to ask patients at some point in time, any belief in God? And people are a little quizzical, like, what do you, what do you mean about that? But any belief in God? And it's kind of unassuming. They say yes or no, and you can say, what's your belief system? Is that a source of strength for you? So I went through this kind of uh, talk, and I said, you know, any belief in God? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, if you'd asked me that two years ago, I'd have said, no. I thought, well, that's kind of curious. And so my curiosity was piqued. And so I, I, of course, asked him, well, why two years ago, a couple years ago, it wouldn't, but now it is? He said, well, it, it's something that happened to my neighbor. That's why I believe in God now. Uh, he said, well, do you have time? I looked at my watch and thinking, I don't have time, but kids, do we always have time for God and what matters most? We always have time for that, and we make time for that. So I said, absolutely, I have time. And so he, he started telling me a story about his neighbor. His neighbor was very sick. He'd been sick for a long time, in and out of hospitals and clinics, and the problem was with his liver. What organ did I say? His liver. Now, where's our liver found? Do you guys know? Yeah, somewhere in the guttle region. It's not the technical medical term. So, kids, what I want you to do is take your, your right hand and put it on your right part of your abdomen, just underneath your rib cage, okay? And then I want you to push up underneath there and take a deep breath in. And if you're thin enough, which I'm not, you'll feel <laughs> your liver poke down. In fact, we'll do that little test to see if your gallbladder is affected, all right? But that pushes the liver down, and that's where your liver sits. Now, do you guys know what your liver does? It cleans. It cleans your blood. So every time your, your heart's beating, it's circulating through, the blood goes through, and it filters, and it cleans. And if your liver starts not working quite as well, some of the stuff that's normally broken down and, say, put into your intestinal tract, where you get rid of it that way, it builds up. So you look at people with liver problems, oftentimes their eyes will be yellow because the breakdown product of blood cells builds up in the bloodstream, and the liver normally cleans it out, doesn't, is not able to. You'll know, one of the other interesting features about the, the liver is that it produces something called albumin. Albumin is a, a protein, and this protein is very important because it helps suck and keep fluid inside the blood vessels. And if you don't have enough albumin, guess what happens? Fluid starts leaking out, and particularly in the legs, you'll see people with liver failure, they'll have their legs start swelling, and you know, there's different reasons for swelling, but that's one of the reasons you can have leg swelling. And you'll notice that also, this albumin is very important for carrying things, enzymes, which are chemicals that speed up reactions, and vitamins, and different things, and, and hormones are transported by albumin. So albumin is very important. How many people have ever fallen? Kids, has anyone fallen in the last week? All right, 50% of the kids, that, that's pretty good odds. Now, when you fell, did you scrape yourself? And did you cut yourself ever? How many people have ever fallen and scraped their, their, themselves? How many people have ever had blood coming out of them because they've scraped themselves that hard? Now, did your blood keep coming out and oozing and oozing and then going faster and faster until you were a blob on the ground you couldn't get up? Hopefully not. If that happens, call 911. But in this case, <laughs> you stop bleeding. Do you know why you stop bleeding? Because there's clotting factors that are produced by what organ? The liver. Liver sounding pretty important, isn't it? And if we don't have the liver and liver's not functioning as well, guess what? People start bleeding more readily. It's not very good. So the liver is an amazing organ God created. And do you know what's so, so cool about this organ? It can grow back. It's one of the few organs that can grow back. It's so cool. You can cut off half that liver. And guess what? Over time, how long do you think it takes before you can cut off a huge chunk of your liver and it'll grow back? How much time do you think? A year? How long? 15 hours? That's an ambitious year. I, like I like your organ system. I like that. Someone's been watching some sci-fi movies. Not quite. Th no, I'm kidding. That's a great. Any other guesses? A year? Somewhere between a year and 15 hours. I'll give you the next hint. Six months. Excellent. So three months, within three months, you cut off a huge chunk and your liver goes back to its regular size. If, say, you were to have a poison you would ingest, we should never do that, but if you ingest a poison and it knocks out 50 to 60 percent of your liver cells, guess how long it takes to, for that liver, those liver cells to regenerate, assuming the liver is fully there? One month. One month. This is how cool this organ is. So you can see why I'm a little excited about this liver. Now, unfortunately, 
And I, I want to, well, fortunately, let me read a verse to you that, that made me think of the liver when I read this. This is Psalms 139, 14. It says, I praise you, God, because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. It says before, the verse before that says, for you created my inmost being. That includes that liver. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. So when you start studying the human body, you go, wow, God has to exist to see these amazing things. The problem was with this neighbor, he didn't have good liver function. And sometimes we put things in our bodies, alcohol, if you keep doing that over and over and over, as amazing as the organ is and the body, God's ability to create that, the ability to, to, to rebuild itself, eventually you, you scar that liver over and eventually it doesn't work anymore. There's other poisons that can be ingested that can cause that. There's something called fatty liver where people who are obese, they're sedentary, they don't exercise, their fat builds up, and over time, some of the people, not all of them, that's very common, but sometimes it can lead to the liver failing. There's, there's different things that happen, so eventually it reaches a point. Well, unfortunately, this man had a situation where his liver was failing. And do you know what the treatment for a liver failure is? If it's not going to ever recover, do you know what you have to do? He was a part owner of a billboard company. True story. So do you know what he did? He took out a bunch of billboards. And you know what a billboard is? You know, we just did our seminar, right? What, what was that the, on, the, on the 400 freeway? You saw a big billboard advertising our seminar, our Revelation series seminar, right? Well, he took out a billboard, and you know what his billboard said? Something along the lines of, I'm dying. Can someone help give me part of their liver? He had that billboard in different areas. And you know one of the areas he had it? Do you think it was just in, in Georgia? It was actually in a huge state called Texas. Good, good. You guys are falling here. A huge state can only be one thing, right? Texas was where the billboard was at. Now, there was a guy that was driving to work. He was about 21, 22 years old. And every day on the way to work, he'd go the same route on the freeway. And there, one day he was driving by, and he looked up to the right, and he saw this big billboard that said, please help me with an organ, with a liver transplant so I can live. And normally you see signs or whatever you drive by, but you know what? There was a voice in his head that said, you need to help that man. He's in the car by himself. Well, what do you mean? I, he kept driving, but that, he was like, that was, that was weird. Like, no one's in the car, but I heard that voice in my head saying, you need to help that man. So he, he thought about it more the rest of the day, and he's like, okay, well, maybe that was just, that was just weird. The next day he drove to work, and you know what he heard in his head? You need to help that man. Okay, I heard that again, and no one's in the car with me. And he was a God-fearing man, and he was a Christian. He'd do his devotional every morning. He started praying about it. He's like, Lord, I don't know what I'm supposed to do, but you want me to give him part of my, my liver? I, I don't know. The next day he drove to work, and the same exact thing happened. And this time it was louder and more audible. He's like, you need to help this man. He got to work. He didn't re recall the phone number or the website he's supposed to go to. He, he said, he called his, his family at home. He said, this is going to be the strangest request. God has impressed me. I need to give you part of my liver. True story. And the person that was flabbergasted. I said, wow, uh, uh, okay, okay. Well, he said, what do I do? Well, I, I don't know if you can actually be a liver donor because you need to do what next? You need to test to see if you can even give your liver because guess what? If you have different blood types, you right away, the body will reject and say, I don't know, this thing is foreign. I don't know, I don't want anything. So he had to do blood testing, which they look at different markers. And what do you think happened with the blood testing? Do you think they overlapped? Perfect 100% match. So the next step was you need to fly to Atlanta because that's where the, the transplant surgery is going to be done. So he flew to Atlanta on the appropriate uh, week. And they said, well, before we do the surgery, we need to map out the architecture. It means we need to make, see what that, uh, that liver looks like. So they did a CT scan, which is where they take a bunch of x-rays and a big machine, and they reconstruct a three-dimensional image of everything in this abdominal area. And the doctors were shocked, shocked at what they saw in this 22-year-old guy. Do you know what they saw? Inside his liver was a tumor, a single isolated cancer that was there, which is incredibly rare and rarely if ever seen. He had no symptoms, all the blood tests were fine, liver enzymes were fine, and they did the scan and found it was cancer. And so instead of giving his liver as a life-saving measure, his life was saved. Wow. 
There's a verse in Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and who have been called according to his purpose. He was a young man that loved God. He had been called by God, and God said, I want you to help someone else. And if he didn't want to go help someone else, guess who would have suffered? He would have suffered himself. So God called and said, listen, if you're going to be humble enough and go out and serve others, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to reward you. Satan never intended people to have cancer and death and make bad decisions and have injury to their livers, but that's the world we live in. And God said, listen, humble yourself, serve other people, reach people with the good news of Jesus Christ, and if you, it's in your ability to help others, help others. So if God ever speaks to you, just like Daniel in the Bible, he kept calling Daniel, Daniel, and finally Daniel said, speak now, Lord, for your servant is listening. That's the same kind of attitude I want each and every one of you kids to have. Speak now, Lord, for your servant is listening. And who knows, maybe your life will Dear Heavenly, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for everything that you did for us. Please um, help us to be willing to do um, every, everything for you and help us to learn more about you. Um, please help us to be willing to give to others freely and thankfully. And thank you for making us. And in Jesus' name, amen. And as a result of that, that's how my patient came to believe in God. That's part two of the story. <laughs> I, truthfully, I don't know the, uh, the end. So the question is, why don't you feel the, the pain if there's something growing inside? Because it, it has to reach a certain critical threshold size before you start having it or block some kind of duct, like a bile duct where you start having other symptoms where yellowing of the eyes or uh, some of those other symptoms a little further advanced. So the, the awesome thing was they caught the tumor early enough where they could actually surgically intervene. That's not always the case. So uh, you, don't, you don't ever do a transplant with someone who has uh, cancer. You don't ever want that because there could be microscopic uh, seeding of that, of that liver. So I don't know actually what happened. It was a long story to begin with, and I didn't have any more time. I did want to know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> to God be the glory. That's the whole point. Thank you for that, Dr. Jeff. I would qualify it that he is a bona fide doctor. And he's answering our questions and helping us keep in line. Thank you for that story. Loved it. God does save, doesn't he? Amen. You know, speaking of saving us, um, that billboard that he mentioned um, on 400 for lightgeorgia.com, it's still there. Uh, they've left it up. And so let's just pray for people because it has a link on there, lightgeorgia.com. So if anyone's watching right now, if you go to media dot lightgeorgia.com it takes you directly to the video so you can watch the whole series it's there um, but let's pray for those people we're in our prayer time now let's pray for everybody who's watching those videos and for all of us here and for you know it's a good refresher for us to go back and review that material because there's so much happening right now right before our very eyes and that material it definitely applies to what we're going through right now what we're going to see coming in the days following so I'm going to open up the floor um, for praises. So do we have praises on this November 7th, the seventh day Sabbath, um, prayer request day. So let's go into praises. Who has praises for us today? Jeff. So I just want to clarify, I'm sorry, I'm not perfect in my, in my rhetoric. Satan intends us to have cancer. God never intended this. I, I guess I was wrong. And I said Daniel instead of Samuel. So I apologize for the incorrect nature. I was pointed that out by my daughter, who's a biblical scholar of the family. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm thankful for kids who keep us online and on track. And so, you know, they're apparently learning something, which is good. And the little child shall lead them. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for that. All right. Uh, any other praises as I look around? Jetta.
Amen. And that was such a wonderful event. Um, we're so happy, Ivan and Jetta. We're just, wow. We're all beaming, I think. Actually, I had to take a second look because I was looking down the list, and I'm like, Jetta Morris, Jetta Morris. Oh, yes. <laughs> That's right. It's Jetta. So it was such a blessed event, and I'm glad. Um, you know, God is protecting us, too. You know, he does. And we pray for that protection. We do everything we can on our part by wearing of the masks and keeping our distance. Um, but, you know, he is, he is definitely with us. All right, any other praises? Wow, you guys don't have any praises today. Pat, Pat, what's your praise? Amen. You know, oh no, was was this approved through the church board, Bonnie? I'm I'm not sure. We have to take a vote later after church. Everybody, just <laughs> Bonnie, what a help you've been um, to Pat, and uh, we just value your time that you've dedicated her uh, to be here with her. And Pat, we're not going to abandon you. So you just, of course, we never have, so we're going to be here for you. And we did enjoy Bonnie's musical talents. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for that. All right, praise for the music. Any other praises? I'll go ahead and open up to prayer requests and praises. We can combine it now, so prayer requests and praises. I'll start it out. Let's pray for our leadership, whoever it may be. Um, you know, God's in charge, and I think today during the sermon, uh, we're going to see that more. Um, you know, but God leads and he protects. He brings kingdoms up and he brings them down. And let's think about the individuals, too, in all those races um, going for office. God is placing people um, that belong in certain positions and removing people that don't to see what he sees for us and what needs to happen for his return. Amen. Let us not fear or be dismayed. God is leading. All right, so let's pray for our leaders, whoever they may be. Now, I saw Amy's hand go up, and then Pat. Dina, I just always want to say, I know God has dominion over heaven and earth, but I just do hope that truth and rule will all be brought to heaven and earth. Amen. 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 Pat. Well, I just want to say, I pray for <laughs> now, this is Pat Clark she's talking about. Right before COVID really hit, we had a baptism of her. So, okay. Did she go see somebody about the falling down? She's still, no. She's fine with hurting so bad. She's fine. They went to the doctor. Okay. Good. But, uh, and also for Joy, my oldest daughter, Joy, and her husband, Clay. Uh, she had uh, open heart surgery the day I left. Continue healing for him. Lon. Like the praise that God's word says he's going to bless those that bless Israel. Amen to that. God definitely covers us and blesses us even when we fall, which I think we studied about in the lesson today, right? If we fail, God still comes through to us and says, you know what, you can make it right. And uh, God will lead us in that pathway. Thank you for that, Lon. Any other praise? Uh, Prayer requests. Okay. Amy. How sometimes we would love to force them into a decision. Our own family members, right? But we just pray and intercede for them, so let's not forget to intercede. Job interceded for his children every day, we're told in the Bible, didn't he? 
Let's intercede for everybody. I mean, our families and then for each other too. All right. Anyone else? All right, well, uh, Sonia. Very good. All right, as far as possible, let us all kneel together as we come to the Lord. many prayer requests today and so we just lift all of these up to you and father I've got requests from the Koliako family regarding neighbors who have heard the light and are thinking about us so we ask that you you show them the way that they will be open to your word and also a man named William at Ingalls that he's considering a move out to the country so give him wisdom in that and of course, our children who are facing finals and schools at the universities, that they go well as they continue their education to further uh, their lives and to further your work, Lord. We also pray for the Greg and Gurney families today as a church, that you might lift these families up and throughout the week that we might re remember them in our daily lives. And Father, we pray for all those people who have the potential to see the LightGeorgia.com videos and those presentations that you had us put together, that you placed there, and that you've kept that sign up there for people to see the link. So Father, as people watch, help them to turn to the Word and to know you personally, individually, wholeheartedly. Father, we lay all of our silent requests at your feet. I know there are many here, Lord, that have not spoken what is on their heart. So at this moment, Lord, I'm going to pause as each member here and all those who are watching online take a few moments to raise up their requests to you. And now, Father, we pray that we keep ourselves close to you, that you take charge of the leadership of this country. And Lord, as we are your light and beacons, give us the words to say, especially give Elder Andrew the words to say as he presents your words today, that we might be inspired to know you better as our personal friend and completely have faith in you. We ask this all in the name of Jesus, our personal friend and Savior. Amen. Amen.
oceans deep, my faith will stand. And I will call upon your name and keep my eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, my soul will rest in your embrace. For I abounds in deepest waters your sovereign hand will be my guide where feet may fail and fear surrounds me you've never failed and you won't start now so I which it appears that it is now. We will, be, we will be fine. I'll just have to stay put and stop wandering around so much. Let me see. All right, I haven't forgotten anything behind me, I don't believe, except for my trusty, dusty slide advancer. So let me see if this is working. All right, that is working. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for the beautiful, special music. I'm probably not the only one who was thinking about the experience of Peter as that song was being sung. And it made me think that even though the storms of life may sometimes overwhelm us and sometimes we're not able to keep our eyes above the waves, even if we start to sink, 
we can call out to Jesus and he will catch us and he will pull us back to safe ground. You may have been wondering, as we sung our uh, opening song, why is the speaker running off the stage? Did he get stage fright? Did he forget that he was supposed to be speaking today? What's going on? Well, it's just a good example of how I can't do anything on my own. I had a PowerPoint ready, and you can see it on the screen, but as I was sitting up here, realized it doesn't do much good to have a PowerPoint ready if you didn't actually give it to the AV folks in the back. <laughs> so I had to quickly fix that, and thank you so much, you guys back there, for being so quick and nimble to get it up. It just shows you what happens when I try to do something on my own without my wife helping me and making sure I'm not screwing it up. <laughs> so putting all of that aside, it's been an interesting week here in the United States of America, hasn't it? Unfortunately, Unfortunately yes, yes. It's turned from, I guess, election day into election week. Nobody get nervous. We're not going to go too far deeply into the political issues today. But as we've been going through the various twists and turns of the week, counting the votes and, and the various issues that have come up, it did make me think, as I was preparing for this sermon, you know, no matter what happens, I'm thankful that I live in a country where we have rules and laws and processes that we can follow. And whatever happens at the end of the day, whether it's your guy who wins or the guy that you didn't like who wins, I'm confident based on the history of our country and, and uh, the rules and laws that we have in place that there's going to be a peaceful transition of power and that there's not going to be huge, you know, military interventions or other things that you've seen happening historically when leadership may or may not change. And today we're going to study the story of a different kind of transfer of power, the fall of Babylon, which was very much not decided by votes, but by military power, and as we'll see in this story, by divine intervention. So let me set the stage for you. We're going to be working out of Daniel 5 today, the fall of ancient Babylon. And the scene is this. The city of Babylon is besieged by the armies of the Medes and the Persians. And King Belshazzar knows this. This is an obvious fact. But he's not worried. He's very confident. Babylon has huge, thick, high walls and doors or gates made of brass. They have food stores that can last them for, year, for years. There's a, a, a river that's running through their city. They think, you know what? Our city is impregnable. They can't starve us out. They can't thirst us out. Is that the word? I don't know. You know what I'm trying to say. We're good. There's nothing that they can do to us. There may be an army at our gates, but we are feeling safe and secure. And this is where we pick up the story in Daniel chapter 5. Uh, so I invite you to turn there with me now. We're going to be working out of this chapter quite a bit today. And I don't have all of the verses on the screen, so you might have to actually, you know, flip your Bible or, or you know, flip your iPhone over uh, Daniel chapter 5. And we're going to begin this story and see how does King Belshazzar respond to this army at his gates. In verses 1 to 4, the Bible says, Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords, and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives, and his concubines might drink therein. Then they brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which was at Jerusalem, and the king and his princes and his wives and his concubines drank in them. They drank wine and they praised the gods of gold and of silver, brass, iron, and wood, and of stone. So what do we see here? Well, we see a gathering of political leaders. It's the king and it's his lords. So these would be the high-ranking officials in the government, maybe somewhat similar to having the president, whoever that may be, and the senators and, and the representatives in some sort of state function here. And what do they do? They drink wine and they engage in religious worship, a false religious worship. And so let's mark out a few points, a few key elements we see in this set of passages, uh, characteristics of the fall of ancient Babylon, what's going on here. So first, like I said, we see the political leaders of Babylon drunk with wine. We see a combination of state. See, my instinct here is to start walking over here. I gotta stay home or you won't be able to hear me. So 
You see a combination of state and false worship. We see that Babylon is praising common things as gods, right? So it's said that they praise the gods of gold and silver and stone and wood, these common things. They praise them as if they were gods, and they treat sacred things as if they were common. They take the vessels from the temple, which are holy, meant to be used in the temple ceremonies, and they drink wine from them as if they were just a common goblet. So how does this compare to the fall of modern Babylon, or we might say spiritual Babylon, that the book of Revelation talks about? And just to refresh your memories, the book of Revelation talks about spiritual Babylon that will fall towards the end of time and also describes this same end-time power as the beast from the sea in Revelation 13. Daniel describes this same power as the little horn in Daniel 7 and Daniel 8. This is the end-time enemy of God's people, which we know at some day will fall. So what will be happening shortly before the fall of spiritual Babylon? How does that compare? And for the sake of time, we're not going to do a full Bible study. I'm just going to summarize some of these points for you. But number one, the book of Revelation says that the earth will be drunk with the wine of Babylon. And excuse me, I'm not a good enough speaker to do two things at one time, so I'm going to pretend I'm smoothly just putting this on while continuing to preach and nobody will notice whatsoever. Don't, t- oh, don't touch it. Okay, that's probably a good idea. <laughs> Let's just do a test. Can you still hear me? Still on? No, it's not still on? It's probably because I touched it. Yeah. Sorry, we have a rescue operation coming here. There we go. Perfect. Thank you a lot. The, the AV team wins the day again, so let me just push this down here. So, Revelation 18, verse 3 says this. Uh, uh, says that the, the, the earth is drunk with the wine of Babylon. So we see a similarity here. Okay, what about this combination of state and false worship we see in ancient Babylon? Well, the book of Revelation again tells us that the beast will force the world to worship the beast and the image to the beast. So you'll have a state-enforced form of false worship involving modern Babylon s- uh, shortly before its ultimate fall. Now, we see ancient Babylon was praising common things as gods and desecrating things that were sacred. What does spiritual Babylon, what does modern Babylon do? Well, they take a day which is common, an ordinary day, which is Sunday, and they say, let's treat that as a holy day. So they treat something common as if it were holy. And then, of course, what do they do with a holy day, with Sabbath? Well, they say, well, we've changed the holiness of Saturday to Sunday, of Sabbath to the first day of the week. And so that holy thing, it's not holy, it's common. Treat it as any other day. And so we see in the setup of this story very similar conditions to what Babylon, uh, to what Daniel faces in ancient Babylon and to what we as God's end time people will be looking at as we are ready to face modern Babylon or spiritual Babylon. So it suggests to me that this is an important chapter of the Bible for us to study, and that perhaps there are some lessons for us here in how Daniel goes about confronting the king and giving God's message for that time. So, let's continue our story, reading in verses 5 to 9, and I'm just going to summarize this, so we're back in Daniel 5, 5 to 9. The Bible says, In that same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand, and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. And then the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loosened, and his knees smote once against the other. And just to summarize the rest of this, he calls in the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the other soothsayers of the empire and asks them, can you interpret this writing that's on the wall? What does this mean? But nobody is able to interpret it. Patriarchs and Prophets adds this description to the events. She says, before them, passed as in panoramic view, that is before the king and his lords, passed as in panoramic view the deeds of their evil lives. They seemed to be arraigned before the judgment bar of the eternal God, whose power they had just defied. When God makes men fear, they cannot hide the intensity of their terror. You see, where did we pick up with Belshazzar at the beginning of the story? Yeah, there was an enemy at the gates, but he thought he was safe. 
He thought he was secure. He didn't think his position was threatened in any way. He had a false impression of his state in the world and certainly of his state before God. We see that in his desecration of God's holy vessels and not having any concern that there was a God in heaven who would judge him for his actions. And it seems to me that sometimes we can have perhaps a temptation or a danger of falling into that same sort of state. Remember, we're the Laodicean church, right? What's the defining characteristic of Laodicea? We think we're okay. We're rich. We're increased with goods. We don't need anything. But what does God say? Well, you're poor. You're wretched. You're blind. You're naked. So let's not fall into this same trap. Let's not fall into the same danger that Belshazzar and Babylon fall into. Let's accept by faith God's assessment of our state. And let's make sure that we are not in this position before the judgment bar of God while realizing all of the sudden there is no place to hide. And as much as I thought maybe I was okay, the truth is clear to me now. Let's prepare now. So Daniel, or I should say the king, has no one who can interpret this writing. And in verse 10, the queen comes and reminds her drunk son that there is someone who might be able to interpret this writing. And if we pick this up in verse 10, it says, Now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house, and the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let that night not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. There is a man in the kingdom in whom is the spirit, and notice the description of Daniel here, in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods was found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, the king, I say thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers. For as much an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding and interpretations of dreams and showing of the hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in this same Daniel, whom the king named Belshazzar or Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. So notice here the stark contrast between Daniel and the king. You have the king and his lords who are drunk with wine. They're reveling. They're not paying attention to the current situation on the one hand. And then on the other hand, you have Daniel, who could not be more different. He has wisdom. He has understanding. He has an excellent spirit. And even people who do not follow God can see in him that the spirit of the holy God is in him. And likewise, at the end of time, God will have a people who are characterized by wisdom, by understanding, and by the spirit of God in them. And this makes me think uh, of a parallel to the story or a parable that Jesus tells in Matthew 24. There's a story of a good servant and an evil servant. We can turn there here. I have this one on the screen for you, so no flipping on your part necessary. Jesus describes the good servant. So the master goes away. What are the servants doing? Jesus says, well, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. So the good servant, well, his Lord is away, gives meat in due season. And if you keep reading the chapter, what does the evil servant do? What does the unfaithful servant do? He says, my Lord delays. He's been away a long time. He's not coming. He's not returning anytime soon. And he goes and he drinks and eats with the drunkards. He becomes drunk. We might say drunk with the wine of Babylon. So if we want to be good and faithful servants like Daniel was, we need to be giving meat in due season, not drinking and eating with the drunkards and saying, well, my master isn't coming. Which leads, of course, to the question, so what does that mean? If, if Jesus says we should be giving meat in due season as we prepare for his coming as his faithful servants, well, what, what does that mean that we are supposed to be doing? And Desire of Ages gives us a good explanation of this on page 634. Uh, and it says, those who are watching for the Lord are purifying their souls by obedience to the truth. With vigilant watching, they can buy an earnest working. These are the faithful and wise servants who give the Lord's household their portion of meat in due season. Now, so what does that phrase mean? They are declaring the truth 
that is now specially applicable as Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Moses, and I might add Daniel, as we'll see in this story, each declared the truth for his time, so will Christ's servants now give the special warning for their generation. So, the good servants, the faithful servants, are following the instructions to give meat in due season, which means to give the special truth or the special warning for their time, right? Noah had a special warning for his time. He preached about the flood that was going to come. Daniel had a special warning for his time. He had a three-part judgment message that we'll study as we get into this sermon. That was the message he has been called to give to Babylon. We also have a message that we have been called to give to the world. We'll study that as we get further into the sermon, but for now, I'll leave the point here, which is that the good and faithful servants give meat in due season. The special message for our time, the thing that's relevant for us at the end of time, is what we are called to do and the message we are called to give as God's servants, and not to fall into drinking and eating like Belshazzar and like the evil servant. So as the story continues, the king takes his mother's advice He calls in Daniel. He says, Daniel, if you interpret this writing for me, I'll give you these great rewards. I'll give you the third place in the kingdom, gold and silver, riches. And Daniel says, keep your rewards for yourself. I'm not interested in those things. And then he reminds Belshazzar of all of the opportunities that he has missed, that Babylon has missed, all of the outreach God has done to them, how he revealed himself to Nebuchadnezzar, how he proved his power through the life of Nebuchadnezzar and through Nebuchadnezzar's time with the beasts before his kingdom was restored to him. And he essentially says, look, God's given you all of these chances and you've squandered them away. You knew better. And the reason that you're in this position is because you have not responded to God's call and the opportunities he has given you to govern according to his principles and to use this kingdom of Babylon to fulfill God's purposes. And so as a result of that, God has given you this message, this three-part message that was written on the wall. And so we will pick up that message here in verse 25. And Daniel said, this is the writing that was written, meeny, meeny, tekel, eupharsin. This is the interpretation of the thing, meaning God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. That's part one. Tekel, thou art weighed in the balance and found wanting. That's part two. And Perez, the kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. So we have this three-part message of judgment that God gives to the Babylonians just before the fall of ancient Babylon. So let's look quickly at each of these pieces and see what does this mean. So the first was that God has numbered your kingdom. Now if you look up the word numbered, the Aramaic word behind that in Strong's Concordance or any other sort of commentary, it can be translated as numbered or counted out or weighed out. And the idea here is that God is examining the record, the deeds of Babylon, and he is weighing them out. He is seeing what is good and what is bad. So in other words, God is investigating the history or the record of Babylon as part of his judgment. This is sort of investigative language. And as a result of that investigation, you have the second part. You've been weighed in the balances. The evidence that was found was stacked up against each other. And you've been found wanting. So you're guilty. That's the second part of this message. It's the verdict. You have the investigation or the fact finding. Then the verdict is given based on those facts. And then finally, you have the sentence. The kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. So investigation of facts before verdict and sentencing. Now, I would be remiss since I just talked about giving meat in due season and talking about, you know, the special message for our time. If I didn't take a moment to develop this idea of investigative judgment a little bit further. Like I said, this is God's method or pattern of judgment that we see in scripture. And just to show you some examples of that, and then we'll discuss maybe what this means and why it's important, we can go back to the very beginning of the Bible to the first judgment that takes place. In Genesis chapter three, this is of course right after the fall. Adam and Eve has sinned, God comes to the garden, they hide, 
And what do you find God doing when he comes into the garden? Well, he's asking questions. He says, where are you? Who told you? Have you eaten of the tree? What is this that you have done? And we see God taking a similar approach. If you turn the page over and go to chapter 4, the story of Cain and Abel. Of course, Cain murders Abel after Abel's offering is accepted and Cain's is not. And God comes to Cain and he says, where is Abel your brother? What have you done? So God is conducting what you might call an auditory examination. He's examining the evidence by asking questions from a witness to find out what has taken place. And then based on what he finds out, he then gives the verdict guilty and the sentence. Adam and Eve kicked out of the garden. Cain forced to wander the earth with a mark. Um, But the investigation comes before the verdict and the sentence. We can give more examples just going in the book of Genesis here. Following along, oh, this is incredibly tiny, so that's going to be my fault. (laughs) Notice how I said I can't do anything right on my own. This is just another example. So I will tell you the verses I'm referring to, and if you're wanting to know what they are, uh, you can write them down or talk to me later. So the first one is Genesis chapter 6. Genesis chapter 6, this is the story of the flood. And as God is preparing for the flood, uh, in Genesis chapter 6, it says the Lord saw how great the wickedness of all the human race had become on the earth. He saw. He's doing a visual investigation. Similar language in Genesis 11. This is the story of the Tower of Babel. The Bible says the Lord came down to see the city and the tower. Genesis 18. Now we're talking about Sodom and Gomorrah. God says, I will go down to see if what has been going on And Sodom and Gomorrah is the same as the outcry that I have heard. God is investigating. And just to give you one from the New Testament, there are many other examples that we could give. Matthew 22, this is the parable of the wedding feast. And it says the king came out to, what? He came out to see the guests. And he saw a man there who did not have the wedding garment on. So the king, representing God, comes out. He sees. He investigates by looking visually. He sees someone who does not have the wedding garments on, and that person is kicked out. So whether it's auditory by asking questions, whether it's visually by looking and seeing and going to see what's going on, we see this pattern of judgment repeated throughout the Bible, where we have an investigation followed by the verdict and the sentence. So a natural question, I think, is certainly a question that I had. Why does God do this? I mean, doesn't God know everything? God knows the beginning from the end. So why is he showing up in the garden saying, where are you? What have you done? Does he already know what Adam and Eve have done? Does he already know what's going on in Sodom and Gomorrah? So why does he need to go see? Why is he asking questions? Well, I think it's interesting if you read the story of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 18 and Genesis 19, read that this afternoon and ask yourself, what's the focus of the story? What emphasis is being put on the story? And I would suggest to you the emphasis of the story as it's told in Genesis 18 and 19 is on God helping Abraham and then Lot to understand what he's doing. So he tells Abraham, I'm going to go down to this city where your relatives are, and I'm going to see, I'm going to investigate whether it's really as wicked and awful as I'm hearing. He's helping Abraham to understand that whatever happens, whatever judgment comes down, This is not just a fireball coming out of the sky that Abraham doesn't understand. He's going to understand that God is going through a fair process to investigate and then to give a sentence, to give a judgment based on what he finds. And that is going to be a fair process. So one purpose of the investigative judgment, one purpose, one reason why God does things this way is so that we can understand and see the evidence and so that the watching universe can understand and see the evidence, and that everyone can know and see that the judgments God makes are fair and accurate based on evidence and not just arbitrary. That's one. But a second purpose, a second purpose of judgment, and in the Bible you see a second purpose of this type of judgment is that it vindicates God's people, it vindicates the saints. Um, Let's see if I've put this next slide in the correct font or not. Cross your fingers with me. Yes, you can see it. Perfect. So just in the book of Psalms, you can write these down if you're interested, there are several examples of this. We'll look at one together for the sake of time. Judgment 
being something that the saints even invite so that they can be vindicated. So if we go to Psalms chapter 7, I'm going to start reading in verse 6. And the psalmist says, Arise, O Lord, in thine anger, lift up thyself because of the rage of my enemies, and awake for me to judgment that thou hast commanded. So shall the congregation of the people compass about thee. For their sakes, therefore, return thou on high. The Lord shall judge the people. Judge me, O Lord, according to my righteousness and according to my integrity that is in me. Let the wickedness of the wicked come to an end, but establish the just. For the righteous God trieth the hearts and reigns. My defense is of God, which saveth the upright heart. God judges the wicked, and God is angry. Judges the righteous, and God is angry with the wicked every day. So what's going on here? The psalmist is being accused. He's being attacked by enemies, and he appeals to God for judgment. He says, God, if you put all the facts on the table, if you assemble the nations before you, and you investigate and you judge, I'm going to be vindicated. When the facts come out, I'm going to be innocent. We see a similar dynamic if we flip over to Daniel chapter 7. Daniel chapter 7, looking at verses 21 and 22, uh, and if you have read Daniel recently, you'll remember that earlier in this chapter, this judgment scene opens with thrones being put in place and books being opened. So in other words, there is an investigation of the facts going on by opening the books of record and seeing what is happening. And as we get to later in that same scene, Daniel says, I was watching and the same horn was making war against the saints. This is, again, as we mentioned, the same horn that's referred to as the beast, Revelation 13, as, as Babylon, or as the little horn. He's making war against the saints and prevailing against them until the Ancient of Days came and a judgment was made in favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time came for the saints to possess the kingdom. So the saints are in the same position as this psalmist was. They're being pursued and attacked by enemies. But when God pronounces judgment, the judgment will vindicate the saints. So this is good news for God's people. The judgment shows that they are one with God. So, just as in ancient Babylon, when their kingdom was divided, when, it, when, when the judgment was given against them, their dominion was given over to their conquerors. It was given to the Medes and the Persians. When spiritual Babylon falls, its dominion over the earth is given over to its conquerors, to Jesus and the saints as co-heirs with Christ. And so, I would suggest to you that two reasons why God has establish this method or pattern of judgment that we see throughout scriptures is number one to show the universe that he does things in a fair and legal way number two because by getting all the facts out it shows that the saints are vindicated it's in our favor for him to do this in this way now in preparation for this judgment on babylon i'm forgetting i can't walk around anymore back home back home Sorry, it's a self-correcting problem. Even I can hear it when I leave. But in preparation for the fall of Babylon, God sent a three-part message to ancient Babylon, which we just read. And in preparation for the fall of spiritual Babylon, he has also sent us a three-part message of judgment, which are the three angels' messages of Revelation 14. So I would invite you as we turn there to Revelation 14, let's take a look at the three-part message for our time and see how it compares with the three-part message for Daniel's time. Revelation 14, we'll pick up with the first angel's message. This is in verse 6. I almost said, and Daniel said, this would actually be John. John says, I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, unto every nation and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. Worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of waters. 
So what is the message of the first angel? The message of the first angel is to fear God and give glory to him during the time of the investigative judgment. So we see God again following his same method or pattern of judgment in this final judgment message that we are to give, calling people out of Babylon. Second angel says, followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen that great city because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. So Babylon is fallen. This is the verdict. Babylon is guilty. And the third part here, the third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, if any man worships the beast in his image and receive his mark on his forehead or his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. The sentence what happens if you partake of Babylon? You'll drink of the wine of the wrath of God. So we see this same three-part judgment message paralleling quite closely. First, the investigation, the numbering or counting out of the record. The verdict, your kingdom is taken away from you. And the sentence, it's given over to the Medes and the Persians, or in this case, if you participate in Babylon and her crimes, you will be drinking from the wine of the wrath of God. The same three-part judgment message we see here as we saw with the fall of ancient Babylon. Now, as we transition towards closing, I'll have three main points, three main takeaways that I suggest we can learn from this story. One of the takeaways being, stay at the microphone, Andrew. Stay at the microphone. That that, no, that was not one of them. So consider that a bonus. Four takeaways. <laughs> three takeaways from this story. So the first takeaway, and I guess I could actually show it to you on the screen, is we need to stay on mission. Remember, what was the faithful servant doing right before Jesus came? What, when Jesus comes, what did we find him doing? He was giving meat in due season. He was giving the special message that was relevant for his time. What do we see Daniel do in this story? You know, I'm sure that there were a lot of things wrong in Babylon, if you know anything about the ancient world, it was not exactly a friendly, warm, and loving place. I'm sure that there were a lot of social problems, a lot of unrest, a lot of abuses, a lot of things that should and could have been corrected by the government in order to make it a better place. You know, Daniel could have come and said, listen, you've enslaved my people for many years. Um, their lives matter too. Please let us go. Release us from our bondage. My wife is waving me back to the microphone again. I'm going to get this eventually, I promise. But Daniel doesn't do any of those things. He sticks to the message that God has given him for his time. He gives God's three-part judgment message for ancient Babylon. And I think we are called to do the same thing here. In fact, I forgot to mention this earlier, but let me strengthen the parallels here. So why do we know we should be giving the three angels message? Well, if we go back to Daniel 5, verse 5, Daniel 5, verse 5, you'll see that the message is written on the wall next to or across from a candlestick. So the candlestick on the wall is what illuminates the judgment message that God has given. And I would remind you that in Revelation, the first couple of chapters, what is a candlestick representative of? A church. And it's God's seventh church, the seventh candlestick, the Laodicean church, who has been called to give light or to illuminate the three angels' messages, the three-part judgment for our time. Remember, Laodicea means a judged people. And so our message as the Laodicean church is that we should fear God and give glory to him because we are a judged people. We are living in the time of the investigative judgment. And the second thing I forgot to mention is who could interpret the message that God gave to ancient Babylon? It wasn't everybody, right? It wasn't the other soothsayers and Chaldeans and magicians. It was only Daniel. It was God's true prophet who could correctly interpret those messages. And similarly, God has given his last day church a true prophet through whose writings can help us to correctly interpret the three angels' messages. And if you read the writings of the spirit of prophecy and compare them to the Bible, you can see that they are in harmony. It helps us to correctly interpret the three angels' messages. And so God has given us a mission. He has given us a message for the world. And much like Daniel, there are many things that we could become distracted with, right? We have our own social problems. We have our own political problems. We have 
uh, our own problems within the church. Uh, we've been hesitant sometimes to share this message for a variety of reasons. Sometimes we're afraid of offending people. Well, what if there are visitors here and they hear us say, well, look, the investigative judgment is going on. God is judging the world. What if they're scared and they run away? Well, folks, I would suggest that if somebody hasn't the person who needs to hear it. Let's not be afraid of offending people. You can tell the truth, and people get to make their own decision about how they react to that. Amen. Similarly, uh, you may have seen in your life in the church, I'm not talking about this specific church, just the church in general, the tendency to say, well, look, we've been saying Jesus is coming soon for a long time. Maybe we should focus on other things to help the church grow and thrive. Maybe we should look at our worship styles. Maybe we should work, look at, you know, different gimmicks and uh, things that we can do to help, you know, keep the young people in the church. Maybe if we have, you know, coffee and donuts out there, that'll motivate people to come in. Maybe if we change our message in some way to make it more appealing, that'll help people to come in. And we're not called to change the message. We don't have the authority to do that. You know, I was just reading a biography of uh, Caesar, and, and I thought it was interesting that as it described many battles that Caesar's army fought, that Caesar had subordinates called legates, sort of like his second-in-commands, that were in charge of different parts of the army. And the historian pointed out many times that uh, during battles, there were times that would come up where a decision had to be made and maybe an opportunity presented itself. But Caesar wasn't there. He was at a different part of the battle. And even though it seemed like there was an opportunity, even though from his subordinate's mind it looked like, hey, maybe if we change strategy and do something different over here, that will lead to victory. It was not their place to make that kind of decision. Only the general could make that decision. Only the person who had the full view of the battlefield strategy. And so even though things looked good to them at the time, even though things looked promising, even though from what they could see, they said, listen, if we just go and advance over here and take this hill to lead to us winning the battle, they did not do so because that was not their decision to make. And as a result, many times, the army was saved because Caesar ultimately had his strategy in control and it was not the place of a subordinate to make that decision. It's not our place to look around the world and say, well, but I see these other problems. I see these other things. Surely we should be focusing on those more. Well, no, I would suggest maybe a principle here is that should we be involved in the world? Obviously. But let's make sure our involvement in the culture and in the issues support our giving of this three-part message, the three angels' messages. Let's make sure it enables us to do that more effectively, not distracts us doing other things that, while they may seem good to us, take us away from the mission that our master has given us. We don't have the authority to change the mission. So point number one, just like Daniel stayed on mission and gave the three-part judgment message for his time, I suggest we should stay on mission and make sure we are focused on doing the work God has called us to do for this time by giving meat in due season. Number two, don't delay. Daniel, when faced with his test to, street, to speak the truth of these messages to a king who probably would not like what he heard, was faithful, and he did as God asked him to. So how was he able to be faithful, even in difficult circumstances? Well, it wasn't by waking up that morning or by being called into the throne room and asked, he's on his way to the throne room saying, oh, by the way, God, I know we haven't talked in a while. Maybe we had a good relationship years ago when you gave me those dreams, when you helped me interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dream. But let's pick that relationship back up right now so you can help me in this situation. No, if you turn back in the Bible, uh, the Bible says that Daniel, in Daniel 1, chapter 8, Daniel, as he's on his way to Babylon, knowing he's going to face these different temptations, says Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So what does he do? He makes a conscious decision. I know I'm going to be in conflict with Babylon. I know it's going to pull me in a different direction away from what God wants me to do. I'm deciding in advance I'm going to be faithful to God. And then what do you see in the record of his life throughout the book of Daniel? You see Daniel unfailingly being faithful to God and his friends, by the way, which I, I assume that they made the same decision. 
when the music is played and the statue is there, Daniel's friends don't bow down. When Daniel is called to give witness for God, Daniel does it. And so I would suggest that now is the time for us to similarly decide we are not going to defile ourselves with the wine of Babylon. We are not going to become distracted from our mission. We are going to be faithful to God and then to allow the Spirit of God to work in us to live lives of consistent, faithful obedience to God so he can develop our characters and our relationship with him so that when the time comes, we can also stand up and give the message God has given us for our times. You know, I'm reminded of the story or the parable of the ten virgins. Five are wise and five are foolish. If you wake up at the midnight hour and you don't have the oil, there's no oil to be found. You can't get the Holy Spirit. You can't have that relationship with God at that time. We have to be getting that oil. We have to be building that relationship with God. We have to be asking for his spirit now so that when the test comes, we're ready. And finally, we'll close with a point that Kevin very eloquently made already, which is remember that no matter what happens, God is in control. It's an especially relevant point for this week. It's easy to get you know, caught up in the twists and turns of who our next leader will be and what all of this means for us. But let's remember, as Daniel went through these experiences, as he was taken into captivity, as he was the servant of one empire and then that empire falls and another empire takes place, we don't see Daniel obsessing over the political twists and turns of his day. We see Daniel focused on serving God, whatever the circumstances around him may be. And so I would encourage you that although we may not know everything that's going to happen, and although you may be happy or sad at different political twists and turns that happen in our world today, remember that God is the one who takes up kings and, and sets them down. And that whatever happens, our job is not to spend more time focusing on the kingdoms of this world than it is to f spend time focusing on the kingdom of God. Amen. So let's make sure that our focus is, is on God's kingdom and doing the work that God has called us to do for his kingdom and that we're not focused more on the kingdoms of this world than we are on the kingdom of God, which we know is ultimately where our home is. So as I close today, I just encourage all of us now Let's be faithful to God, giving the message he's given us for our time. Let's decide now to be faithful and to continue to do that. And whatever distractions Satan may throw at us as we move through time, let's keep our eyes on the prize. Let's be faithful to God and be his messengers for a world that needs to hear the truth. Amen. Our closing hymn today will be, I don't have my bulletin with me, but it will be a great hymn. You're going to like it a lot. I'm not going to sing it. I told you I can't do anything right. Stand up, stand up for Jesus. So, stand up for Jesus. How about that? Two, four, nine.
Dear Heavenly Father, as we leave this place on your Sabbath day, help us to stand up for Jesus, to be the faithful servants that you have called us to be, bringing the message of the three angels' judgment warnings to the world in this hour of need. Please bless everyone here. Guide us and keep us as we go throughout this week. We pray in your name. Amen.